Well, hey, everybody, thank you for tuning in to this new style of video that we're doing here that we kind of just call the message breakdown. Um, I had this video idea for a little bit um, of just being able to sit down, the two of us here, and um, kind of break down Eric's message a little bit more. I think uh, I kind of coined the term like the pressure of the pulpit, where like maybe you forget something or you gotta you, write uh, a book. <laughs> write a book. <laughs> and like uh, maybe you didn't get to say everything that you wanted to, or maybe you didn't think you explained something like quite exactly the way you had originally planned to. Yeah. Um, and I just think this is something like, I'd totally listen to this if I'm like, you know, going yeah. on a drive or something and I need a podcast to listen to, or maybe you're at home and you're watching this too. Um, yeah, I just think this is a great opportunity to just kind of chill out a little bit more and yeah. be able to talk about your message. And uh, yeah, I think this will be awesome. So, I do too. I'm yeah. excited about it. It's a great idea. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, cool. I'm ready to go, man. Yeah, yeah. so am I. All right. Got my coffee here, a little <laughs> caffeine to help. So, nice. yeah. Um, so, I think first off, um, because the verse for this week came out of Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Yeah. Um, I was just going to read that here a second, okay. and then um, maybe you can give us a little recap, um, break that down for us. So um, Galatians 1, verse 10 says, uh, Apostle Paul, Am I not trying to win the approval of human beings or of God, or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I think this is a really really good verse that is just applicable mm -hmm. at all times. So, um, yeah, why don't you just kind of give us a little recap? What do you, well, what's I on think, your mind? Well, I think when Paul says, am I now trying to win the approval of people or God? He's he's saying, you know, he's he's being so hostile in his tone that um, it's not pleasing you know, like yeah. think think Gordon Ramsay on Hell's Kitchen when he's like <laughs> yelling at people. He doesn't care what they feel about him. He cares that something better is attained. Sure. And I think the Apostle Paul in that way is saying, look, I, I don't care if you don't like this. I care more that you know the truth of the gospel and you live according to that. So, um, so yeah, I think that's why it's an important kind of central verse to the theme of chapter one in Galatians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. So um, in the message that you said people won't be, happy with, um, won't be happy with you all the time when you live to please Christ, would you say it's a warning sign if you never face any opposition living as a Christian? Okay. So let me ask you this. Can, can, um, can you be a champion if you never face another opponent? No. Yeah. I, I would say so. I would say if that's the case, you're now looking at a seven time like Grand Slam winner of the, you know, <laughs> of the French Open, even though I've never played on a clay court, right? I the the reality is that um as Christians, there should be opposition mm -hmm. to us. There should be opposition because the love of Christ lives in polar opposite um, in a polar opposite spirit as as that of Satan, the great the great accuser of our souls, Christ being the lover of our soul, uh, Satan the accuser, he seeks to destroy things. So why wouldn't there be um, a clash of worlds in that? And I would say if you're not facing opposition in your faith, you're probably doing something that encourages the wrong side. That's the way I would look at it. I would be very cautious in my own life if I wasn't facing some sort of opposition. Not that opposition is the telltale sign of good things. There's times where God brings godly conflict in. But there are times where, not times, there is supposed to be a static opposition to who we are as Christians based on the fact that the Spirit of Christ lives in opposition to the Spirit of this world. Yeah. So, um, it's it's kind of the idea like um, with with in World War II when when the Soviets uh, were kind of piled up ready to to face there was a salient over in the east in the Army Group Central and what the Germans were going to do is try to close off in a pincer move and close off that salient of Russian forces and destroy them and what happened was on paper they looked really good. The Germans had great equipment. They had um, they had a lot of manpower there and different things uh, to kind of make it look like it was really good. 
the Soviets had been bloodied and beat up a number of times, but this was after the Battle of Stalingrad. And what we look at and see is on paper, the Germans looked really good, but you couldn't quantify on paper what it meant to the German psyche that they had lost the Battle of Stalingrad. So on paper, they looked kind of unbeatable. In reality, they, they were very much beatable. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really what broke the back of the Wehrmacht right there, right? So they, they, they were opposed by something, and on paper, they looked like they should win. The opposition for us in this world, you're going to be opposed by things, and we need to realize sometimes it will reveal in us weaknesses where we thought, oh, I'm doing good in my faith, and then we fall into a temptation or we fall into something that is um, counter to the Spirit of God, and we have to live in the, in the conviction I would say the moment of repentance and turning away and the brokenness of losing that battle, but knowing that because Christ loves us, even though we failed in the face of opposition, we have learned an area where maybe we were too proud and thought we were okay. Mm -hmm. We were a bit stronger on paper than we were in reality. Yeah. I've faced that so many times in my life, so I think opposition is critical to the Christian life because it's building the strength to push the kingdom forward. Mm -hmm. And the kingdom isn't always won by violence. It's won in the kingdom of Christ by the subversive love of Christ that undermines the powerful. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, that, that reminds me of, um, haven't we used the saying of like, if, if you're not making mistakes or if you're not failing, like, then you are yes. failing. Like. Yes. So if there's, yeah, I think it's important to have those moments um, in anything, but especially your faith, um, yeah. where where you feel weak, or if you're you're facing opposition and, yeah. and stuff, because I mean, you know, those are great opportunities to growth. Yeah, and yeah, that's that's really good. Well, have you ever failed forward in your job here? Like Absolutely. If you, yeah, like oh, yeah. you do something and it was a great idea. And yeah. You're like, this is garbage. <laughs> but but you tried, right? You yeah. made the effort, and you're like, oh. But what you do is you take that loss, and you're like, oh, okay. Well, I know what I'm not going to do next time because what I did this time didn't turn out. And in the same way in our Christian life, we may think, this is no big deal for me. I'll just motor right through. And the enemy will have laid a trap for us and we will fall morally or we will um, distance ourselves from God because we feel safe and secure on our own two feet. And we find ourselves stumbling and falling. And we realize the next time we face that challenge, there's these alarms in our head that says, you know, last time I went through this, I failed. Failing and failing forward are two different things. Mm -hmm. When we face opposition, we have the opportunity to fail forward. We're going to make mistakes. Do we grow? Yeah. Do we humble ourselves? That's where I think um, the subversive love of Christ is so redemptive. Even our mistakes can be moments of great growth in our faith and in our walk. And that moment of growth comes when we face opposition and maybe we don't do as well as we should have. You know, I think of this yesterday. I watched the game. I didn't watch the game. I watched, I was watching it on my phone as the plays were going. I'm like, why is the Las Vegas Raiders, why are they beating the world champion Kansas City Chiefs in Arrowhead? I listened to all the pundits and they said they, the, the Raiders have no business even being at Arrowhead Stadium on Sunday. They are not nearly as good a football team. They ended up beating the Kansas City Chiefs, who on paper, we're supposed to mop the field with them. But, but what happens is, is you come into that thinking, I'm fine. And you got Patrick Mahomes, who's a freak athlete. And that's me, a Broncos fan, saying that. They're in our division. I hate playing Mahomes. But here's what happened is you get a team that comes in thinking, yeah, that's right, they have no business being up against us. And forgetting that their opponent is real. Though I think the Raiders are not the best team in the NFL, they are still in the NFL. And they... I mean, they beat them at home yesterday. That's what happens to us sometimes. We get lax about the opponent we face, and that opponent is wily, and that opponent is crafty and will find our Achilles heel. So we have to be willing to learn when we fail and fail forward, but we also have to not take, uh, not reduce our enemy in our own minds to think it's no big deal. This is a battle, day in and day out. Absolutely. So you should be facing opposition. And if you're not, it should be a check in your spirit that maybe you've already given in to the battle and you're being 
dominated yeah. in some way. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. it's the greatest battle that we face too. I For mean, sure. like as Christians, like that's our journey is with Christ and mm-hmm. we're called into this world to like bring other people towards him and like, yeah, that should be the most important thing. And Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And if you find yourself not ever having those evangelistic conversations or discipleship relationships, what, what I would say is if you're not having those, why would the enemy oppose you? You're doing nothing of <laughs> harm to him. Yeah. You know, if you're just like, well, I go to work, I live a good life and, and I don't hurt anybody's feelings. It's not the gospel. Yeah. I mean, even, even Jesus came. I mean, I think, um, I don't want to call it like a forgotten verse or anything, but um, I'm trying to think of where, where exactly it was. But it was like he said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Yes. I mean, I'm probably not quoting it perfectly, but I Actually, think that that's is important how it to remember. Reads. That is how yeah. it reads. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good for me. I know. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would love to be like, it's in this, but I, I off the yeah. top of my head, I can't remember, but he did say that. Yeah. And, and there is a reality that, um, that he is, in, as a self, Christ said, you know, he's a stumbling block for many. There are people who break over the cornerstone of Christ and they're like, I just can't, you know, make that leap. I can't believe why others fall deeply into belief and transform living. So Jesus knows his identity, his very person is going to cause the rising and falling of many. And and we just have to be people who are in pursuit of faithful, courageous obedience to him and him alone. And if we do that, I guarantee you, you will find yourself being radically opposed. Yeah. By by people, good people, um, by by bad people, like you'll you'll be opposed by people who live the the Christian life. You'll be opposed by people who are pagan. You will be opposed on all sides. Mm-hmm. It's just an interesting yeah. phenomenon. And, and you know, it's a scary thought too, because I mean, you know, a, a lot of people deal with. I mean. This is kind of going back to Galatians 1 verse 10, like people pleasing. Like I, there's people who say like, oh, I'm not a people pleaser. And I was like, well, I think deep down most, if not all of us, have that thing in us yeah. where it's like we want to be liked by people. And, you know, it's it's hard not to be. And, you know, I mean, I've I've dealt with times in my life where like I've been like the person in the room who's like the odd one out or whatever mm-hmm. because of like something that I feel or something that I've said. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's not a fun feeling. And no. you know, it's kind of what we're, we're called to is right. like being the people who speak in the culture and like, no, that's wrong. And you know, and, and he said like, yeah, he came to bring a sword. Um, but it doesn't mean that we're like, I don't know, going, going in like full force and everything. Like, no, we, we, we speak peace too. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's important for us to... And maybe that's for one of our future conversations, yeah. is to look at that scripture and say, okay, what does that actually mean in its context? Because outside of context, we could advocate for a pro-war theology that may be completely errant, right? And I would say, let's let one of our next conversations, yeah. we should look at that verse and be like, last yeah. time we talked about this, here's a snippet on the context of it, because Christ, by his indicators, is the Prince of Peace. And um, the Prince of Peace brought about peace for us. He won peace for us through his own violent death. Now think of that. As an American, peace for us has come by the violent death of our enemies, not us, right? We inflict the damage and cause them to capitulate. But Christ did the opposite. So I would say this is a scripture more, uh, we should tune our ear towards that in context and focus because I think we could have a great conversation. Yeah. And I think some people would be like, what are they gonna say, you yeah. know? Um, but yeah, I think it's an opposite spirit conversation. That's awesome, yeah. cool. We'll just like yeah. table that one. Table then, so. that one. <laughs> well, cool, let me ask you something else then. So okay. um, you had brought up First John uh, 3 verse one in your yeah. message. And so that verse says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So what does it mean that the world doesn't know Jesus and won't know us? So I would say there is, um, it's kind of funny, there's a passive sense of knowing. 
So there's a passive sense of knowing someone where you know of them and possibly benefit from their choices and their concerns for certain things in this life. You don't know them personally, but um, you have no personal connection to them, but your knowing of them is informed. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah, so I, I look at that and I'm like, okay, there's a passive sense of knowing. And then, and I would say for most of the world, they don't know Jesus, but they don't know how much of him they're actually aware of. Yeah. Um, Tom Holland has a book out right now. It's called Tom, Dominion. Who's Tom Holland? Tom Holland, not the Spider-Man. Not Spider-Man. Spider -Man. Oh, not Spider -Man. I love Spider-Man. <laughs> Toby Maguire was better, but. Oh, was Toby mm. McGuire better? I, I love the old ones. <laughs> and here well, we are. That could are. be a separate podcast. <laughs> you could be the first my guest gosh, on that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my word. Um, so, so Tom Holland wrote a book um, called Dominion, and it's how the revolution of Christianity shaped the world. And the reason I would look at that and talk about it for a minute is because um, there's a difference between the passive knowing someone and their causes and concerns in some way benefiting or impacting your life so you know of them without a connection to them. Then there is the, the knowing of someone, understanding the differences between a happy smile and a hollow smile. When you know someone well and you have an intimacy with them, you can see a smile that maybe you know, and I'll, I'll use my example. Erica can look at me and see the difference between a happy smile and a hollow smile that you will never pick up on. Yeah. She will know something of that because of, of the connection. The tone of, um, of their voice being adjusted by just a tiny amount that, um, that can trigger for the listener an avalanche of emotion, of expectation, of fear, of joy. When we know someone and we live in some sort of deep relationship with them and we engage in the nuance of being privileged enough to be witness to their life. And when I say witness, like... Um, I always worry, like, what should I get Erica for her birthday? What should I, what should I get her for Christmas? But deep down, uh, the reason why is not because my wife is wildly materialistic and demands great gifts like Marie Antoinette. No, because for her, it is a being known. Absolutely. It's being known. That yeah. gift is a way of saying, I know you right? It's the nuance and it's a privilege to have that and um, to both benefit from them but also bless them and what matters to them and speak life into their being and it adds value to their life. So there's two different kinds of known, known the passive and this very intimate known, and a lot of us live in between these, but we have these different knowns and I would say a lot of people... Um, when we say they don't know Jesus Christ, there are so many things that they don't know are Jesus Christ's influences in their life. And that's why I brought up the Tom Holland book. Dominion talks about all the things that are truly Christ-centered, transformational, revolutionary concepts that we live with as static, status quo understandings of life in this day and age that did not exist before Christ was born. So we know of things, we just don't know they're his. So hospitals did not exist mm. before the church began to provide hospitality to the sick and the dying. Why? Because with Christ, there came, a, I think, um, was it Gregory of Nyssa who, who talked about the intrinsic value of human life because it was created in the image of God. So when that theology that you are created in the image of God um, comes to bear on this world, we need to understand that didn't, the value on human life didn't exist before Christ. People 
would, um, people's lives were utterly expendable. And slavery was common the world over from the very earliest days of recorded history right up until the abolition of slavery. And you wonder, why did it take so long for the Christian value on life to affect the slave trade? You can see in part, in like clear detail, that the war between the human value of the value of human life and our value on money. The slave trade was beneficial for countless millennia before Christ came. They were all, there was always slavery. But what happened was Gregory of Nyssa said, wait a minute, every human life is valuable. Whether they're poor or whether they're you know, Caesar, they're valuable just the same to God. They're created in his image. And we live with these things. Like here's a few examples, I wrote them down. Hospitals, burial for the common man or woman. People were just piled up into mass graves. Um, and, and in that book, uh, Dominion, it talks about uh, the, the hill for the very wealthy out in Rome when they expanded the city out. And it was the hill where people were just thrown. Their bodies were just thrown and they had to clean it up so they could build some of these gorgeous villas when the city of Rome expanded. Burial for the common man and woman. Slavery. So really slavery, the, the inexcusable evil of slavery was not abolished in our country until after the Civil War. But what happens is we see that's actually something that came about, you know, 1900 years earlier in Christ adding value to the human life. So we know of these things. Power, wealth, and influence were not the chief end of our lives, but knowing God and having a relationship with him as our eternal creator who called us into life with him. So this life wasn't anything. Here's one of the cool things, gender equality. The, the, the right for women to have equality was not only established in creation when woman was fashioned out of a rib, mm-hmm. the side of a man, right, yep. co-equal, different roles, but equal, just the same. Absolutely. But the, the gender equality really took root and the curse was broken, and we talked about this a few weeks ago in, uh, at the Foundry when we talked about Mary Magdalene was the first woman to see Christ. And she was, she was the first one brought up, you know, like shown the risen Christ. Mm-hmm. And the woman who fell in the garden first and the woman who was redeemed first. We see this great gender equality. Paul, the apostle, raising up women to lead in the churches in different things. Now, Paul had some harsh words for other women leaders in cultic religious cities, and that's contextual, and we can talk about that. But there was also this idea of like hope for justice. There was no justice in the ancient world. There was the rich, the powerful, and everyone else below them. But we have this idea that everyone deserves a right to have a voice in their own life, in their own existence. We know something of Christ in this world. Our value system is created Christologically in our modern world. Yeah. And the problem is, as our world fades away from being a Christian world, what do we do with all these Christian humanist beliefs? Because if we are biological happenstance, which is, um, which would be evolution. If we're just biological, the byproduct of millions and billions of years of cells doing their thing, mutating, eventually you get this. Um, (laughs) If that's what we are, then why shouldn't I oversee and persecute you and take from you everything I can so I can have all I want because this is all I get? Yeah. That is a logical thought unless you have an intrinsic value by who? Jesus Christ. Exactly. So I would say in this world, when we cry out for justice because of what happened to George Floyd, when we cry out for justice, when there is, when there is people who can just speak lies constantly in our culture and no one's held to account for lying, for deceit, for wrecking human lives and doing different things, when there's different things that happen in our world and we can look at them and say, we know that's wrong. The reason we know it's wrong is because Jesus Christ changed our value system. We do know of him. We've cre- our society is created around the values that Jesus gave us in his own life and teachings. But really, in the end, what, what I would say is the world knows it, but they keep wanting to corrupt and um, fabricate a cheaper version 
of morality. Right. They want a morality around something that um, doesn't transform the inside, the heart, what is truly broken. Our sinful nature isn't fixed by morality. It's fixed by the blood of Christ. So that's what the world doesn't know, is they don't know they're forgiven in Christ completely. They just feel like they can do enough good deeds so that in some weird karmic sense, their karma weighs out even in the end, and they go to a lesser hell. I don't understand that moral yeah. theology. But in the end, what they don't know is the fullness of the gospel, which means for you and I, our life becomes much more intentional because the world already understands the language Christ spoke. Mm -hmm. Our humanist system speaks his values. We could use that in our favor. They know something of it, so we actually have a springboard to bring the rest of the gospel in. You're valuable. Why? I don't have to explain why. You just know you're valuable in this day and age. Yeah. 2,000 years ago, people didn't know they were valuable. They were chattel property. So, yeah. There's a whole lot of wisdom There's in that. A whole, well, it's, it's what, I mean, I'm reading that book. It's really good. I, I kind of want to read this now, too. Yeah, I, I don't do a whole um, lot of reading, but I think I do I now. I will <laughs> tell you this. Here's a good thing to do on it. Um, read the review, um, uh, who wrote it? Tim Keller wrote it just a couple weeks ago, a uh, review on uh, Dominion, how the Christian revolution remade the world, and the article on it is called Nietzsche Was Right, which, yeah, Nietzsche's the one who said God is dead, but it's fascinating. I'm sure. no huge fan of Nietzsche, but I will tell you this, like this, this review got me into the book and then I came home the other day and my wife had the book and she bought it for me. No and way. Like, yeah, yeah, she knows my love language huh. and it's sitting on uh, the desk. I was like, yeah. So I started reading it and uh, I just love it. Yeah. I love it because it's so true. We do have a framework to springboard the gospel in, the full gospel, not some morality, but the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so as we were talking about that, one of the things yeah. that stuck out to me because, you know, we were kind of talking about like our intrinsic value and whatnot and of morality. So where would an atheist get morality from? That's a great question. I mean, so who sets the moral code? If we are all an independent agency unto ourself for our own satisfaction, procurement, life, and eventual pointless death, then there is no moral code. Uh, in that, that book I was referring, the, the review that Tim Keller wrote, he said this, can we stay committed to humanistic values as we more and more abandon a belief in God? Atheist George Scalaba, or Scalaba, in reviewing Taylor explains why that question should unnerve us. Now catch that. That question, if we, if our, can we be, committed to humanistic values, which humanistic values, again, is the intrinsic value on each life. Can we stay committed to those if there is no God? And even the atheists are saying, that's a scary end. Because if we remove God and the intrinsic value of people, genocide isn't. You can't say it's bad. You, you can't fact, say it's bad. You can't really say what's good or what's evil. So, I mean, because where does that come from? Yeah. That, right. The good and evil comes from a moral code given by a higher authority. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I can tell you this. That there is physical law, right? And, and I'm, I am no physics guy. I'm not, Neither am I. Science but, is my um, strong suit. <laughs> but the reality is if I jump off this stage head first, I'm going to have some adverse physical consequences, I'm going to have some bruising, some rug burn, maybe even some broken bones, right? Because my action has a consequence. Well, in the same way morally, how can our actions have a consequence unless there's a rule maker? Of course. Unless there's one who made the rule. The physics is the study of these, from what I understand, the realities of all that's going on. And I started reading a thing on string theory the other day, and I was like, I don't understand a word. I was like three words in, and I was like drooling a little. So I'm not pretending to be, I'm not out of my element, going out of my element to talk about it. What I'm saying, though, is the physical realities around us also are seen in some of the, or can be paralleled by the 
spiritual realities around us. Why, why does it break the human spirit to, to kind of debauch itself and, and give itself, let's say in terms of sexuality, to multiple partners without any consequence to who we are and what it does to us. But we can look at people who've done that over a lifetime and they are battered and scarred people. Why? Absolutely. And they'll say, it's because I feel like I gave myself away. Well, what says you have value? If you're just happenstance, who cares? Somebody put value in. And if we're not willing to deal with the reality that the value is there, whether we recognize it or not, I could lay if this was a gold bar and set it in front of you and say, that's garbage. And you can have it. I don't want it. Would you want it? Absolutely. Because there's an intrinsic value in that gold, right? My opinion of it doesn't change it. And I think atheism is beginning to wrestle with the reality that there is a moral code out there that um, there are rules we can't break because if we do, we go against our entire humanist kind of theology of sorts that every person's important, that every life has purpose, that everybody deserves an equal chance, everybody deserves equal justice under the law. If Christ isn't true, then none of that is. If, if evolution is true, you and I are biological happenstance, and anarchy is the answer. It is domination for the sake of satisfaction. That's my opinion on it, but I would, I would be very careful to anyone who wants to pursue an end separate from God because God is the one who put value in human life and we see that so keenly in Christ. The transformation of the world following Christ was, was literally, it's 180 degrees different than it was when Christ came into this world. Why? Why? Because he taught us that there's an intrinsic value in us and the value is seen not just in him saying it, but him living, him dying, him rising again. That's all great, but what happens next is the big thing. And C.S. Lewis said, he's the first one to rise from the grave and when he rises, he pulls all of us up with him. Amen. We are brought up into life with him. Why would that matter? Why is that the central theme? It's because this life is so valuable. There's something in, eternal within us that cries out to say, give me more than the here and now. It's why the apostle Paul says, like, you know, do not grieve as those who have no hope. It doesn't mean death isn't sad. It means this, it isn't permanent for those who are in Christ because Christ valued our souls and he wants to prove it through our living bodies. Mm. That's the way I'd go yeah. with it. And that's, that's an easy topic to talk about forever, too. Forever, And I'm yeah. sure that's going right. to come up again um, eventually. But, like, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot of great stuff in that. And Absolutely. I think it's amazing for people here, too. So, yeah. Um, why don't I ask another question? Okay. Then? So the world admits that it doesn't understand love, like in the songs like you sang or yeah. like you tried to sing <laughs> on Sunday. And, um, so what is the truer nature of love? So let me be honest that we only have a very finite description. I think we have a very finite description in terms of, um, of, our, of our own capacity to love as best we can. Um, and there's only one say, word for it in the English language, too. Right, so. but no, but, and here's, that's hilarious. <laughs> it's every seminarian's first sermon, not every, most seminarian's first sermon. You should have heard this uh, at the church where I was a youth pastor yeah. when you were a kid. And, um, and we would have some seminarians come in, and they would talk about the three forms of love in the Greek language. Oh, man. Agape, which is God love, yep. you know, the, this wonderful love. Uh, philos, which is Philadelphia, brotherly love. Brotherly love. And then eros. eros. Yep. Yeah, the more erotic. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 you've heard that before. Uh -huh. So there is multiple tenses to it within the Greek language, which Jesus would have spoke about. But um, And it's kind of cool because the Apostle John says it this way in 1 John 4.10. These are his words. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son for an, as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So this is love, period, Right? Or is it, it's colon, 
this is love, colon. I don't think there was, anyways. Um, and so it Grammarly. says, this is love, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, not that we loved God, which says something of us. It, this is love, and it's not our kind of love. Love is displayed in that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That is the fullest and best picture of love. We have um, a different version of love in this world, and it's, and it's not always bad. You know, I think... Um, as the father of teenagers, it's so fun to watch them, you know, and they, they kind of get smitten. You know the feeling. I know you're. I was oh, yeah, one recently. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but young love gushes and it flows out of an ex- instinctive kind of headwaters of passion. And it's just like this passionate thing that just, it's earth changing and, and it's beautiful and it's great and it's infatuation, but, but it's, it's very, you can just feel it. Mm-hmm. And then there is a love matured, which is different, which is wonderful in its own capacity to be just as pleased in the unspoken silences and understanding that maybe words couldn't express. Maybe there's no way to fully express what you're thinking, what you're feeling, how much you love someone, other than uh, to reach over and have the incidental contact between your closest companion in this life. And, um, and, and the lengths you find yourself willing to go to safeguard them, uh, to prevent them from needless harm. You know, but also to will them towards the tough things. If I'm honest, that's that's where I found myself knowing what love is. Um, I think I said it to my oldest son the other day. Uh, he's away at college, and I said to him, "Do tough things. Do the tough thing. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be the thing you want all the time. Do the tough things in life. The tough things form character." What I want for my son is for everything to succeed at his first try. I don't want him to have to grind and fail to not achieve his dreams in every way. But deeper down inside of me, I want him to do tough things. I want him to try something bigger than him so that when he walks away, he knows not only his limitations, but what it's like to stand in that hollow in between of attempt and recognized failure. As a parent, you never want your kids to fail until you love them so much that you know what it'll do for them. I want him to fall on his nose once in a while. Get up, dust himself off, and realize, no, he's not Achilles, right? He's not, he's not perfect, but he is able to do the tough thing because I believe this, God loves us, and so he sent his son so that we could be called children of God. And what did God do with his son, his child? He sent him. What has he done with his church? He sends us. And it's a tough thing. It's a calling. It's, it's this gospel. Oh, man, it's so rich and so good that eventually I think what we see in 1 John you know, 4.10, when he says, this is what love is, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son, eventually I, I would hope that in some way uh, there could be a rewriting of that in our own lives, that this is what love is, that God loved me so much that eventually he transformed me into the image of his son and sent that out into the world. And, and to do a tough thing and to carry a cross, I mean, that's still the words of Jesus. If anyone wants to be my disciple, they must lay down their life, take up their cross, and follow, follow me. Daily. Daily. Yeah, daily, right? Um, in saying that, I think you could boil it right down to that phrase, do tough things. Learn what it is to grind. Not because you're just a laborer, but there is something intrinsically valuable, valuable in the work we do. Why? Because God called us and purposed us to please him with our labor. 
So even in the work we do, it's this profound thing that I think matters. I think it really, really matters. So when we say, you know, what if I don't feel passionate? What if Erica doesn't feel passionate about me? I can tell you this. I'm pretty sure there's been some times where she was less than passionate about me, but I've never doubted her commitment and her love to me. I've frustrated her. I've made her angry and vice versa. But our commitment doesn't waver. And I would say the same is true on a hyperbolic scale of God. We do things all the time that disappoint him and break his heart, yet his love for us is seen in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I go back to that verse all the time. Why? Because my nature wants to be sinful. And when I fall into some sin, I know I have to go back to God, kind of head, hat in hand, and just, you know, repentant and sorry, and let him redeem that and work through it. So I would say um, the truer nature of love in our lives will always be viewed most clearly and applicably. It can be applied to our life when we look at the life of Christ and understand our calling within his life to the lives around us. So that, that would be my answer. I, that might be my favorite answer, but yeah. I really like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Isn't that good? Yeah. 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 And like you get done with this, you're like, yeah, I'm going to go <laughs> tell somebody about Jesus, yeah. you know, because. Well, I we mean, need that encouragement too. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like the most important thing that we can do is tell other people about Christ. And it's so, it just terrifies people. And mm-hmm. I mean, but, you know, our our mission in life, I mean, I guess if you think about it, it's, it's to love people. And because we were loved so dearly by God, and it's a, it's a love that's so difficult for us to understand that, like, us who were, were so sinful by nature, mm-hmm. and, like, we've sinned against God, and yet he would send his only son to die on a cross to save us. Mm-hmm. And it's every, like, every time there's, like, a, there's a song about that or, like, you know, you, you see the depiction of it. Sometimes I just, like, almost cry. Yeah. Because it's just so hard to comprehend. And, like, we have such close relationships in our lives, too. And just thinking that even, even when Jesus was talking about, like, how you, and I can't quote the verse perfectly, um, but, like, you, in a recap, it was, like, you must hate hate your family in comparison to how much you love me. He's not, mm-hmm. he's not saying hate your family. Yeah. He's just saying your love for me must be so great because he's loved us so great uh, that it's, man, I can hardly even No, just I speak. get it, but here's <laughs> the thing. Here's, here's one of the tough things with love. And, uh, you know, maybe you'll know this one day. One day when you're a dad, you'll know this. Your child will want something and you'll want it for them and you know they can't have it. And love doesn't give in and say, well, they really want it right now. So I'm going to just kind of give it to them on the down low. Or I'm going to sneak it to them. Or I'm going to just, you know, do whatever and give them what they want. Um, Love is doing the hard thing. And I say this when it comes to like our missional spending and things like that in the church. Um, And one of our missional partners, I I love, uh, one of the things I love about Overland Missions is um, they don't bring a bunch of stuff to poor people to get them to accept Jesus. They bring the gospel into very poor places. And long before they ever do any restorative physical social work, they do the spiritual work of presenting the gospel. And people will come to know Christ. And when my family was there in Africa, um, it was it, yeah, about 15 months ago when we were there, um, we saw 900 people from our mission team, 900 people that were reached in that area came to Christ. It was a wonderful thing, and I'm like, this is great. And the hardest thing to do was to leave them in a primary state of poverty and to come back to this beautiful, what seems like very easy life. And what feels good is to give them our shoes and our clothes and our, you know, when it starts socially scaling up, our farming practices and, you know, like whatever, whatever we want to give that makes us feel less guilty for having something, we want to give it away because we feel bad. 
But true love for us was seen when, when we were like, we want to leave these people with some things from us. And the team leader said, you can't. Because they'll misunderstand that if I accept Jesus, then I get these goods. And we don't want to dilute the gospel. Absolutely, we yeah. love them enough not to solve the immediate need, but to care for their spirits. We left, and then that region in Zambia went through a deadly famine last year. We didn't hear much about it, but through the winter months, so last January, February, no, no, it was uh, December, January, February, and then we continued on as a church. Um, we were contacted. I became very good friends with a pastor there, and we were contacted, and he said, Pastor Eric, he said, people are starving. They're dropping dead. He sent me a video of this, these uh, kids who were boiling poison berries, and they had to boil them and drain them five times just to be able to eat them safely, but they still made them sick, but their little bellies were so hungry. And I, as a pastor who had left them, not giving much to them. You know, we didn't give all our clothes and stuff away. Um, when we left, we, we just left, and we left them with the gospel. And then when this pastor reached out and he said, is there anything you can do? They're not going to survive the summer. Man, at that point, I was like, I was on this computer in all of half a second. And I emailed um, the, the head of our, our missions team. I was like, we have to find a way to get the food from their pastor, not from us. They, those, those folks there will never know that the Foundry Church was part of that. Mm. They just know that their pastor, who had been investing in their lives for six months after we were there, was now... Um, discipling, started a church and all these different things, was now bringing food in for them to help them survive. And it was the two-handed gospel. They brought the gospel of Jesus Christ. People were maturing in their faith. And now when their need was present, we we're willing and able to meet that. Praise God for being able to do that. But that was not our first thing, though it would have been easier to come and feed them all and think what a great thing we had done. A good friend of mine, uh, he was part of the startup of this church. His name's Jacob. He said, we we have to refuse to send people to hell well fed. You've heard me say that. Yeah. You started not. Isn't that a Charles? No, no, no. I have no idea. About, but Spurgeon? I've heard that quote before. Spurgeon? I, um, I know. I heard it from Jacob. Jacob okay. said it to me the first time he said it. I was like, I love that because I don't want to send people to hell well fed. I don't want people to go to hell in new Nikes. I don't want them to go to hell with my nice stuff that I sent to them and they somehow disposed of the eternal gospel for a temporary thing. And I think that's really important. What is true love? It's being willing to do the hard thing. When you truly love someone, you'll want better for them than what they're doing, but maybe that place they're in is a place where God's growing them. And, and uh, for me personally, when I walked through a really, really painful time, and I remember sitting, it was like uh, 12.30 or one in the morning, and um, I had walked into um, one of the bathrooms in our house. Everybody was asleep. I closed the door and... Um, and I put the toilet seat down and I just sat like this um, on the toilet and um, I had my head down like this and I had my Oswald Chambers with me and I just remember whispering a prayer. I was like, God, would you say something to me? I've got nothing to offer. I'm no good. I was so heartbroken and sad and overwhelmed and I opened it up and I read something. I don't remember what. I just remember sitting back and holding it to my chest like this and feeling so completely alone with myself and so disappointed in myself and I was laid so bare in that moment and I could just see with great magnification all my flaws and failures. And the weirdest thing was I knew he loved me enough to let me stay there. And it was a day or two later where I read the devotion uh, in Oswald Chambers where he talks about God, don't think God has left you. I can't quote it, I'll find it. Mm. But uh, don't think God has left you. Be, you should be encouraged if God is silent with you. Yeah, that's how he said it. If God is being quiet with you, you have earned the right to be in the silence of God. It's a sign of intimacy, not of anger. Oh, 
Man, that's powerful. isn't that good? Yeah. And that's where I was. So uh, do I love people? Do I want to give people everything I can? Yes. But do I love them enough to let them learn what it is to lay, be laid bare before God and learn to be in the silence of God, a place of intimacy with him, which will always be uncomfortable in this world. Mm -hmm. If we're in a place of laid bare intimacy with God, a lot of good things have left our life and we're in a lot of pain. It's just the reality. But praise God for not being sent to hell well fed. So, yeah. Amen. That's how I'd answer it. So I think we've managed to have a pretty good discussion here over like the past hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was really good. Yeah. yeah. I think this is probably a good point to wrap it up though. I, okay. I think we've had a really, really good conversation. I'm excited for everybody to be able to um, listen to this and mm -hmm. I, I can't wait to put it out there. And um, yeah, I'm excited to do another one. And yeah. th this is something that we're going to do every part of this series here. Um, and it's a new thing we're trying, and we're excited to see where it goes and whatnot. Um, I think you said that if anybody had any questions, then they could sure. throw it our way. And yeah. we're not 100% sure if we'll be able to get to it in the next one that we do of this. Um, but we can definitely check them out. Yeah. And, um, yeah, this has been awesome. So thank you yeah. for taking the time to, to do this. And it's a good idea, man. Yeah. I'm excited to see where the conversation goes from here and uh, the different directions, the different things we get to talk about. Absolutely. Get to dive in a little deeper. If people like this, yeah, make sure you like it, share it, uh, throw it out there for people. It's a great place to have a conversation and we can, uh, yeah, it, it goes a little deeper than just the, you know, 20, 30 minutes on a Sunday. Yeah. Um, but hopefully it adds to your devotional life. And yeah, it's a, it's a great opportunity to have a, a deeper conversation about what matters most. Definitely. Awesome. Cool. Well, hey, we hope that we can see you again in the next one. And thank you for taking the time to watch this. So um, I'm Kyle. I've been the video director here. And I'm Eric. You have been Eric. So I have been Eric. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We'll catch you next time. Have a good week.